The world is entering a phase where the smallest pieces of technology are deciding the fate of entire nations. And right now, right this minute, a silent arms race is unfolding over a component so tiny you can hold it between your fingers, yet powerful enough to stop a missile storm in midair. What's coming next is not a battle of armies. It's a battle of chips, circuits, and the ruthless speed of innovation. Pay very close attention, because what you're about to hear will reveal how modern warfare is being rewritten by tech most people overlook. Also, if you have a decent-ish, we're talking 14 nanometer, don't get crazy, decent-ish GPU, along with some, um, some DRAM memory, uh, well, probably NAND memory, Ukraine's, yeah, let's go with NAND. Uh, quick difference. DRAM is faster and can store more, but it loses all of its memory when it's powered down. NAND uh, doesn't store nearly as much. It's not nearly as quick, but you can like leave it in the on the shelf for a couple of months and nothing's going to happen to the data on it. Anyway, you throw a bunch of these against a fleet of incoming Shaheds, and if they miss the first one, they just go for the second one and so on. What he's exposing is a complete shift in how nations defend themselves. Instead of relying on sheer firepower, survival now depends on layered digital traps, machines that keep attacking even after the first attempt fails. It's a strategy built on persistence, precision, and relentless automation. And for Ukraine, it's becoming the difference between devastation and endurance. And as we pull back from the battlefield technologies reshaping modern warfare, a far darker storm comes into view, one that has nothing to do with drones, chips, or circuitry. It is a storm driven by threats, fear, and the reckless ambition of one man who has pushed the world to the brink again and again. Because while Ukraine fights with innovation and resilience, the Kremlin fights with something far more sinister, intimidation. And now for the first time in years, that intimidation is starting to fail. The next chapter of this story takes us straight into the heart of the most dangerous standoff of our era, where NATO has finally stopped flinching and Putin's most terrifying warnings are being put to the test. For decades, Russia's leader has built his power on a foundation of threats, loud, theatrical, and often completely unhinged. Whenever he senses the West pushing even a little too close, he resorts to the same playbook rage, warnings of retaliation, and hints that nuclear fire is always just one step away. It's intimidation designed to force democracies into backing down. And since the invasion of Ukraine, these threats have multiplied to a level the world hasn't seen since the Cold War. But something extraordinary is happening now. NATO, after years of hesitancy, caution, and internal disagreements, is finally recognizing what it truly is, the most powerful military alliance in human history. An alliance that does not have to be bullied. An alliance that no longer believes Moscow's warnings. For the first time, the West is openly treating Putin's nuclear rhetoric for what it truly is, a bluff. According to Con Coughlin, this moment is possible because the emotional equation has changed. The fear that once held Europe back is fading. The belief that Russia would unleash catastrophe the moment a red line was crossed has been shattered, not by diplomacy, but by Russia's own repeated failure to act. And now, with Donald Trump signaling he is prepared to use the full strength of America and NATO to corner the Kremlin, the illusion of Russian invincibility is crumbling at its foundation. Coughlin points out that Putin's threats are losing their grip because they've never produced the consequences he promises. From the first days of the war, Moscow claimed that Western tanks entering Ukraine would trigger a wider war. They said advanced jets like the F-16 would cross an irreversible boundary. They warned that long-range missiles, if used inside Russia, would unleash catastrophe. And each time, the West hesitated until it didn't. Tanks were sent. Jets have deployed. Long-range weapons now strike deep behind Russian lines. And yet, nothing. No nuclear strikes. No global escalation. Not even a serious attempt to follow through. The red lines Putin drew so confidently have disintegrated into jokes, moving targets that shift every time the West takes another step. United 24. Media documented nearly 80 separate threats Moscow has issued since the invasion began. Nuclear warnings, promises of retaliation, apocalyptic scenarios, threats of hypersonic missile deployments if Finland and Sweden dared join NATO, claims that Crimea was untouchable, that any attack there would trigger doomsday. None of it happened. Not once. Yet for all of Russia's bluster, the country does possess a terrifying nuclear stockpile, 
over 4,300 warheads, with hundreds ready to launch from land, sea, and air. This is why the threats once seemed credible. But power is not just measured in numbers. It is measured in will, readiness, and strategy. And now, NATO sees something Putin wishes no one would notice. Russia talks like a giant, but fights like a country exhausted and hollowed out by its own choices. Coughlin argues that part of the West's earlier restraint came from the Biden administration, which believed Russia was far more capable than it actually was. Analysts from multiple outlets have echoed that view, saying that Washington treated the war as a crisis to contain rather than one that needed to be decisively won. It took years before long-range strikes inside Russia were allowed, and even then, only on limited targets. But that caution came from a perception of Russian strength that simply wasn't real. Now, the flaws in the Russian system are impossible to ignore. Corruption, chaos, brutal losses. A war that was supposed to end Ukraine in days has ground Russia's forces into dust. Ukraine's Ministry of Finance estimates Russia has lost over 1.17 million soldiers, along with more than 11,000 tanks, 23,000 armored vehicles, and 35,000 artillery systems. These are colossal losses. Numbers that reveal not a military superpower, but a country bleeding itself dry. Even before this devastation began, Russia relied on outdated tactics, poor logistics, and low morale. Today, those weaknesses are impossible to hide. Soldiers being sent to the front without helmets or basic equipment. Units fighting with barely any protective gear. A military philosophy stuck in the past, sacrificing endless lives for inches of land. Land that barely matters. And what has all of this bought Moscow? Just 20% of Ukraine's territory, most of it taken in the opening chaos of the invasion or inherited from Crimea. Since late 2022, Russia has gained just 1.1% more. That is all Moscow has to show for years of meat grinder warfare. This is not the profile of a country ready to take on NATO. This is the profile of a country pretending it still has options. Yet Putin continues to threaten Europe. On December 2nd, he claimed Russia is ready for war if Europe wants it. He insisted that Moscow would finish any fight that began. He warned that if Europe joined peace negotiations or pushed too hard, Russia would remove them from the table entirely. It was classic intimidation, loud, forceful, and designed to scare. But this time, NATO didn't flinch. A high-ranking NATO official responded with remarkable bluntness. Russia is not ready for war with Europe. It might have the capacity to start a conflict, but it does not have the capacity to win one. NATO is larger, better armed, better funded, better trained, far more united than Putin expected, and crucially, no longer terrified. In raw numbers, the gap is overwhelming. NATO fields over 3.4 million active troops, nearly triple Russia's force. NATO possesses more than 22,000 aircraft to Russia's roughly 4,000 to 5,000. Its navy is four times the size of Russia's. In tanks, armored vehicles, precision systems, logistics, training, and strategic depth, NATO dominates every category but one drones, a gap that could close rapidly if NATO accelerates production. This is why Coughlin argues that Trump's willingness to confront Putin directly could be the final catalyst. Russia's intimidation works only if the target believes the lie. If the U.S. fully mobilizes its military and NATO stands behind it, Russia's nuclear threats lose their sting. Putin understands this. That's why his tone is shifting from icy confidence to frantic warnings. He is trying to stop Europe from acting because he knows what happens if they do. The truth is brutal. Russia can start a war with NATO, but it cannot win one. And deep down, the Kremlin knows it. This is why NATO is finally calling Putin's bluff, not recklessly, not casually, but with a cold understanding that the threats were never backed by real intention. Putin has overplayed his hand. He warned the world that crossing his lines would end in catastrophe. The world crossed them anyway, and nothing happened. Now the world watches to see what comes next, because for the first time, NATO is holding the line and telling Putin to prove it. He can't. And he won't, because his nuclear bluff has finally been exposed.